Well, my name is Emily Kreider. It's so good to be with you. I've had an opportunity to preach to you, my home congregation, about a year ago, not quite. I was 38 weeks pregnant, or 37 weeks pregnant, and having Braxton Hicks contractions. <laughs> uh, and we welcomed our daughter, Nora, in September. She's nine months, I have a three-year-old. This time, I'm pregnant again with the surprise of our lives. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm not as pregnant, thanks be to God, so I'll only huff and puff a little bit. But we have been shocked with the news of a new baby joining us in December, and we're thrilled by God's gift to us in adjusting and buying new maternity clothes again. <laughs> so good to be with you. I'm a little mad at Carl and the preaching team for giving me this half-truth at the end of the series. It's loaded, and it's a half-truth that we could use for an entire series. I'm sure every one of the other preachers has said that. But I've been ruminating on this particular one. The half-truth is, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And I've been really thinking about the implications of that statement for months. It hit me right in my core because of my own story in history in the church. When we say, God said it, I believe it, and that's that it really reflects a poor exegesis of scripture, understanding, study of scripture, pulling things out of context to serve our own desire for power, greed, and control. This half-truth is begging us to read more carefully, to understand the character of God more fully, and to appreciate the context of scripture in which it was written, and even by fallen human hands. So this half-truth and its implications uh, with poorly interpreted scripture have contributed to a deeply destructive fundamentalist movement in Christianity. We could talk about this half-truth and how it's contributed to Christian nationalism, white supremacy, the destructive nature of the political moral majority in the far-reaching and sorrowful ways it has maligned and ostracized certain minorities and people groups within the structures of the church. How's that? for a short list of difficult conversations. But before I get in trouble, I'm feeling compelled by the Holy Spirit to speak to you about a really challenging topic to live out in our Christian faith and maybe even in this body of Christ together. So let's read together from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seven time, 70 times seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, the man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had been sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called the servant in, he said, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Torture? Really? Is that the whole truth? Is that half the truth? It would be easy to read this passage and think of God as black and white, right and wrong, give and take. It makes his version of justice simple. If you've been given grace, you extend the same. And if you don't, you will be damned. You will be tortured. It can make us wonder about 
or think that forgiveness must be earned, something to strive after or try hard for, something we have to take hold of and grasp alone outside of the help of God or he might abandon us. But we're supposed to forgive, right? Yes. And hence how this half-truth could get really confusing unless we test it against the character of God in other scripture. So let's talk a little bit about the context of where this comes from to make it a whole truth. We find this passage in the midst of several other parables Jesus is using in Matthew to help us understand the ways of the kingdom, contrasting them to the ways of the world. It's not uncommon for us to see Jesus use hyperbole or the extremes of the story in Matthew as he's, as he's making his point. So to make matters more complicated, Jesus is actually answering Peter's question. Peter's asking about forgiveness. How many times do I need to forgive? Seven? Thinking that that is some grand big number. And Jesus says, no, Peter, cute. Seven times 70. And here the story of hyperbole, extreme, goes on. Again, if we read this in a literal way, we would have to have some sort of list of boxes to check or things to do to make sure that we forgave someone seven times, 70 times, 490 times. Instead, as we test this against other scripture and the character of God through Christ, we find a new definition of forgiveness, the whole truth, not just half of it. So to help us understand forgiveness from a scriptural standpoint, but in modern language, I gave a listen to a podcast that hosted a psychological researcher and clinician who's given her, her whole career to understanding hope, mercy, and forgiveness. And, how, and their implications on our humanness and experience of life. So Charlotte Whitfleet is a professor at Hope College in Michigan. She is a deep and abiding believer in Jesus Christ and has allowed that to also inform her research as she works with people from all different walks of life. She was hosted on a podcast with the title, The Power of Mercy. I commend you to listen to it it's on Hidden Brain. It was a secular podcast but it was really beautiful, her articulation of it. So let's talk about then what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not one and done. Some moment where you say, I'm forgiving them, and that's that. That's all there is to it, one and done. It's not something that you can force yourself into or bend your will or emotions toward. It's not something that you can will yourself to achieve for those of us evangelicals that would really like to achieve it. It doesn't often get pretty tied up in a bow at the end. It's often a long and sordid story, which compels me to talk about what it is. In research, Charlotte Whitfleet talks about how it, it comes in really two types. The first is decisional forgiveness, which is the one and done, that cognitive process, where we say we're just going to decide to forgive and that's it. And friends, I'm sad to say that often we live there in our personal lives and in our congregational life and our spiritual life where we just think we could make the decision and that's it. The second type of forgiveness is emotional forgiveness. It involves an actual change of heart where the positive in our minds and hearts supplants the bitterness or hurt that we have towards someone or something and this is where I actually think the research falls in line with what Jesus is teaching here when he says seven times 70 to make this a whole truth. It's a process, much like grief, that goes seven times 70 times seven times 70 times seven times 70. It's not linear. It doesn't follow a straight line. It's not super helpful for our Western way of thinking. It's a process. Forgiveness is an unfolding journey. It's adopting a different mindset over time with the help of the Holy Spirit in prayer and community in his word. And how much of the pain that you could tolerate in the thing that you need to forgive changes over time, allowing more space in your heart for forgiveness and mercy to develop. Now you might be saying, yes, but what about justice? Sometimes we're called to forgive without obvious justice. 
or a person's willingness to own the pain that they've caused or repent from it, to be held accountable to it. Sometimes we're called to forgive without needing to step back even in relationship with someone who continues to be unsafe or has broken trust, even after we've tried to make movement towards healing. That requires ownership, accountability, and ongoing change. Now, Dave Palmer last week did a great job setting up this topic. He talked about humility and seeing someone's humanness and inherent dignity before God in light of how they were created as image bearers. If we want to have forgiveness actively at work in our hearts, empathy has to play a part. Empathy is putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, recognizing that my humanness is actually not so far from yours. That the mistakes you make, I'm probably capable of as too, capable of too. We are all one step away from making a very human mistake. We're all capable, and actually we all make very human mistakes. But the way to right relationship with one another and with God is ownership. Receiving the forgiveness of God and of that of our community with accountability. The ongoing change that God initiates and uses one another in relationship to bring to completion. This all sounds really hard and painful. A amen? <laughs> Here's the good news. Forgiveness isn't something we emotionally muscle into being. Jesus isn't calling us to do this work alone. He is faithful. Church, he's faithful to begin and complete this work of forgiveness in us. When we read that God will not forgive us unless we forgive others, it doesn't mean he abandons us to the process, but is waiting for our yieldedness and surrender to complete the work of forgiveness in and through us. Amen? Church, we've seen a lot of pain in our midst these last several months. Perhaps some of you have had a history with the church already that's full of spiritual trauma, betrayal, or even abuse. Many of us have had to grapple with the fallenness of our church history, ours locally and ours globally, and its impact on our personal faith and kingdom witness in the world. The evangelical church, hear this, has not been exempt from destruction in its recent history. A little closer to home, and in what our church has encountered in our collective story this year. Some of you may be feeling spiritually betrayed. Maybe by your pastors or spiritual leaders. Maybe in the ways you felt wounded by our presbytery or the process of the session. Maybe some of these folks sitting around you felt like friends and now you're not quite sure what to do because the emotions that rise up within us are confusing. We're not sure if we ought to take sides or how to make our way forward. So I name these things, not for us to feel destitute about them, but to offer a different option. We've had to confront the humanness of our leaders, our neighbors, and ourselves. We now have a choice, to surrender to the forgiveness process or hold a grudge that eats at our ability to heal and move forward as individuals and as a congregation. Sure. The grudge that you nurse will give you a temporary sense of control over your emotions. It might give you a temporary feeling of joy or happiness or as if things are going to be fine. Maybe a temporary sense of relief you might feel. But it won't offer you lingering peace and rest in the end. And it won't offer right relationship with God and with one another. I realize this is a hard word to say to us today. And I don't do it lightly. And if our congregational circumstances aren't the place for you to release yourself into the forgiveness process, perhaps it's with a family member or a friend. I know this experience to be true of my own story. I'm a pastor's kid, grown up in the church, and yet called to ministry. And friends, I've seen it all in my young years. Young, well, I'm getting a little closer to middle age, but that's for another time. I sat under a pastor who was what I came to find out, spiritually abusive from the pulpit, manipulating scripture to make a point to me directly without using my name. 
His daughter was verbally and emotionally abusive to me behind closed doors. And when I asked for her to come to a counseling session and we tried for reconciliation and healing, when I brought this word to light, this experience I was having, instead of reconciliation, I was met with more scriptural manipulation from the pulpit, preaching to me without using my name in my formative years. I was a teenager at this time. I sunk into a really deep and dark depression. And through the help and encouragement of my family, I sought counseling with a really wonderful Christian therapist who could give me a sense and words of what was going on in my life and help me to initiate the process of forgiveness in my own story. Without obvious justice, I was asked to forgive. This therapist helped me to have an accurate picture of what that meant. They could have said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. This is how you forgive. Instead, they gave me the whole picture of who Jesus is and his invitation to grace and mercy. This didn't require reconciliation and a continued relationship with the person who was unsafe. But that unsafe person, through forgiveness, lost the power and control in my life when I let go and entered the process of forgiveness with the help of God's grace, the companionship of Christ, and the good work of therapy and the Holy Spirit. Somehow, God even protected my faith, establishing a call to ministry that really should not have happened, given the circumstances. For all intents and purposes, I should have completely walked away from my faith. I suspect that this is not a story too uncommon for some of you. You may have seen some really dark and hurtful things. Maybe you felt them this year. I don't know. Maybe you felt them with a family member or a person close to you, friends. The grudge will not do you any favors. As we come to welcome Randy Bear next week, I've worked with him. He's a colleague of mine in InterVarsity. And if I'm going to have hope about our church in any way, it's because God has called Randy and Carrie Bear and equipped them for such a time as this. The Holy Spirit will move in and through them if we also yield ourselves to the work of God in our lives. In the ways that he has asked us to be open to healing and forgiveness and genuine grace to ourselves and one another. Before I preach too long, <laughs> we as a community needs, need God's faithfulness and we need his shalom. So as a final word in this sermon, this story and really this whole series of half-truths that we've preached through is about God's faithfulness. The truth is that God is with us, for us, and faithful to us. And it has been weaved through every sermon, even though we didn't talk and plan ahead. The point is, whether we're talking about forgiveness, the need for a better understanding of God's sovereignty, the help of God for the hopeless, God's work in us that we might see God's given dignity to human life, all of them are about God's faithfulness, shalom, whole and complete rest and peace in him together. That's the abundant life. That's the whole truth, not the half of it. The whole truth. We need healing. And as we step into forgiveness, we're yielded to it. We need to own our humanness, friends, to embrace God's gift of forgiveness for us as individuals and for each other. When we do, we empty ourselves of anger, of bitterness, rage. We step into shalom. Now I'm going to do something a little bit unusual here doesn't often happen from a preacher, but we don't really get a chance to reflect much when a sermon is preached with this kind of intensity, or even a sermon series is preached with this kind of intensity. It's deep and complicated. So before we move on today to communion and continued worship, I want to give you a chance to reflect. So I'm going to sing a song over you. So as I get set up here, put on a guitar, and huff and puff my way through it. I ask for you in a moment of silence and of quiet to ask God, what is it that you need to let go of? And how is it do you need to enter into forgiveness? Maybe for your neighbor here or for someone far from here.
regardless, let's open our hearts to the Lord. process of forgiveness in our own lives that we both need to receive and to give. So often, Lord, we don't know how to do that. And so if we need counseling, God, will you give us a nudge to go get it? If we need to humbly confess ourselves to our neighbor or to you, help us, God, to have the courage to do it. And will you remind us, Lord, that the anger, the grudge, it's incomplete. It's not shalom. There's no peace and rest in it. And God, for our congregation, as we prepare for a transitional pastor and for this process of healing and moving forward, would you help us to trust in your faithfulness? We know that you have been faithful in this community for generations, and would you do it again? And again and again and again, for the sake of your name in this city, for the kingdom of God. Lord, we honor, or we desire to honor you, to reflect your name, reflect you in your name, to know your grace. Help us to do that. 
Jesus' name.